It has come to my attention that things outside the basement may not be as fine as we initially thought. My general coping strategy in times like this is to stare at a screen with something fun on it until my brain can pretend it's not happening. But when things are this bad, that doesn't always work. And I have to go with my backup plan, which is to expose myself to something so unfathomably horrible that the real world seems manageable when I'm done with it. So, I watched Dragon Ball Evolution, and now, to help all of you inoculate yourselves against the mind-shattering horror of our shared reality, I'm gonna talk about it. A whole bunch. Too much, even. I've roasted some absolutely dog shit live-action anime adaptations in my time, but nothing quite like this. Full Metal Alchemist, Ghost in the Shell, and even Attack on Titan with that weird single mom thing all at least resembled their respective anime conceptually and aesthetically. Dragon Ball Evolution, meanwhile, completely guts its source material of all substance, leaving behind only a tattered Goku skin suit hanging loosely on the orange and teal tinted action movie skeleton of Michael Bay's Transformers and its way too many derivatives. And while the meaningless dramatic camera sweeps, gratuitous slow motion, and seizure inducing fast cut close up action that typify that style didn't work all that well for most things, they are comically ill-suited to martial arts movies in particular. The whole draw of a good kung fu flick is the choreography, which is best appreciated through long cuts and wide, steady shots that emphasize the motion of the actors. Filmed in the Bay knockoff style, even good fight choreography, which this film doesn't have a lot of to begin with, devolves into barely comprehensible slapstick, which actually pairs quite nicely with DBE's goofy-ass script, hilarious awkward performances, terabad special effects, and cartoony over-the-top sound direction. If you're looking for something so bad it's funny, this movie can be a laugh riot, but if you go in as a fan hoping for an exciting big-screen rendition of the father of modern action manga, it's gonna send you into a blind rage in like a minute flat. That's not an exaggeration. Dragon Ball Evolution opens with this awkward CGI prologue thing that exists solely to regurgitate information that's already in the actual movie, because I guess they just assumed only idiots would watch this? Fair enough. And in just its second sentence, that prologue manages to sink the entire franchise it's trying to build. It's kind of impressive, honestly. A warlord named Piccolo came from beyond the stars, aided by his disciple Ozaru evil pair brought the human race to the brink of annihilation. Even people who actively dislike Dragon Ball can tell you that the only connection between Goku and Piccolo is that they're both from space, but this isn't just any old inaccuracy. By changing Goku's backstory and making him the servant of a Namekian specifically, this movie makes it functionally impossible for its potential sequels to adapt either the Saiyan or Frieza sagas, which is Kind of like making Star Wars without the Death Star parts. Of course, only folks already familiar with Dragon Ball will be appropriately disgusted by that, and this movie was meant to reach a broader audience, so just to make sure that everyone else is on the same page emotionally, the film proper begins with almost 30 straight seconds of Justin Chatwin sweating. Like, the real drippy stuff, getting all up in his eyes in super slow motion, that's sure a thing I wanted to look at up close in HD. This is followed by a wider close-up where he looks like he's just high as balls, which it turns out he is. A wild Grandpa Gohan appears and hops on the ropes to fight his stunt double, and I'm pretty sure that's what happens next. The first rule is, there are no rules. Like I said, this style of filmmaking is totally at odds with everything a martial arts film should be. The movie cuts to a different angle for every punch, kick, and goofy-ass reaction, making it impossible to follow the flow of the fight or appreciate the sometimes genuinely impressive acrobatics involved. Though, to be fair, the erratic editing also does a good job of hiding some very sloppy filmmaking. This shot, for instance, goes by so quickly that your eyes don't have time to register this guy, who's definitely Justin Chatwin, going prone against the ropes before he's shown standing upright in the next one, and the shot of Gohan springing back up that follows is likewise so fleeting that you almost don't even notice Justin is very obviously standing on solid ground and just waiting for his cue to do this awkward little wiggle thing like the ropes are shaking. But even fast cut no jutsu isn't powerful enough to hide the Super Saiyan 3 brow bulge from all the blood rushing to his head when he's hanging upside down, or the god-awful form of his wire foo jump sidekick. 
okay, I know it sounds like I'm nitpicking here, but I think it's important to establish early on just how bad Justin Chatwin specifically is at pretending to do martial arts. Anyone who knows the first thing about Dragon Ball can tell you that Goku kind of needs to be portrayed by a skilled martial artist, yet Chatwin's only preparation for this role was a six-week MMA boot camp. In other words, he's a goddamn white belt. And with all due respect to white belts, the first step of the journey is one of the hardest. A goddamn white belt has no place playing son fucking Goku, son. Ignoring the stupid grimace on his face, if Justin had actually connected the kick with his knee locked like that, he'd have spent the rest of the movie in crutches. So he really ought to be thanking Gohan for scaring him off with deadly jewel vapor instead of bitching about it like a sore loser. Shadow Crane Strike, you fell for it again. Yeah, well, it's kind of hard to block a move that I can't see. That's Justin's first spoken line in the movie, and it is completely at odds with who his character should be. Goku takes everything in stride, and few things excite him more than the prospect of learning a new martial arts move, but generic American action movies need reluctant heroes to do the whole journey thing, and thus one of the most iconic, pure-hearted protagonists in all of fiction must be reduced to a typical line teenager. Also a horny one, and while it's already wildly out of character for Goku to be interested in Chi-Chi at all, the sheer degree of thirst which Justin displays toward this film's version of her is straight up embarrassing. Creepy, even. Just watch the way he bad touches the camera with his eyes while imagining her mouth-fucking a strawberry in a field full of flowers. Ugh, can you get a restraining order against a movie? That whole bit is so gross that it might distract you from the film's pathetic attempt to justify an exposition dump about phonemics by having a teacher ask a room full of people with driver's licenses how eclipses work. Then again, you can apparently not know that and still be president, but either way, I'm getting ahead of myself. I know I've already spent a lot of time harping on the opening scene, but as the film's introduction to its version of Goku, it's kind of key in understanding everything that's wrong with him and it. And I think the way he whines to his grandpa in the greenhouse encapsulates that perfectly. What friends? Everybody at school treats me like I'm nothing, Grandpa. They push me so far that I want to explode. Yo, I could tear them apart with one hand. Teach me, teach me how to get the girl. Teach me how to be normal. Normal is also overrated. You must have faith in who you are. This movie doesn't understand that Goku is a character who people like and want to see on the big screen. It thinks of him only as a superhero power set, and its main narrative goal is to take that power set, along with his hot wife, and give them to an angsty, white, teenage geek to whom the presumed target audience can presumably relate. You know, basically just make him Spider-Man, but Goku, and with none of the things people actually like about either character. Now. To you and I, that's a very obviously bad idea, but you've got to consider things from the perspective of someone who's really dumb, but who thinks that they must be smart because they have a lot of money. Someone whose only exposure to people with common sense is reading focus test summaries. You know, a Fox executive. And as the Fox exec saw it, hey, nerds like Spider-Man. They made Superman into Spider-Man for that one mediocre WB soap opera, and that shit got like 10 seasons. And Goku's basically Superman already, so just go out there and fucking give Goku some high school bullies. Tragedy the shit out of his surrogate father figure. Hurry, we're not printing money fast enough. To be clear, my issue with this isn't necessarily that Goku's been whitewashed. He's an alien, any casting choice is theoretically valid, and aside from him, Dragon Ball Evolution has more Asian representation in its main cast than any other Hollywood anime adaptation, except arguably Ghost in the Shell, depending on how you stretch your definition of main character. And yes, that is incredibly sad, but the problem isn't just Justin's look and what it represents about the film industry, it's that in pursuit of that look and the quote-unquote marketable escapist fantasy that they wanted to build around it, the people in charge of this movie abandoned basically everything that made Goku likable and made Dragon Ball successful in the first place. 
a lot of what's wrong with this movie can be traced back to that ass-backwards marketing-first mentality, and the signs of that executive meddling are so stupidly obvious and poorly handled that at times, Dragon Ball Evolution reads more like a parody of this stale formula than a sincere attempt to execute on it. Take the bully characters, for example. The way Justin and his grandpa talk about them sets up the expectation that they're mean and hurtful, but relatively harmless, nothing to do a violence over. Yet the very first thing we see Flash Thompson knock off Gary Fuller do is try to fucking murder Justin with his car in front of everybody. Also, hey, there's that forehead vein again. Are we sure this isn't supposed to be an Akira movie? Now, high school is something of a lawless hellscape, but it's absurd to think that even the richest, douchiest rich douche could get away with that. Still, the power fantasy demands that our hero beat up the bully and steal his girl, and the film's only got, like, 20 minutes to do that before the actual story starts, so this lone instance of bullying has to be pretty extreme to justify it. Then again, it's a pretty extreme, arguably irresponsible power fantasy to be peddling to angry, socially isolated kids in the first place. I don't think cool quieter than them. It's always the quiet ones. It also raises the question of why anyone would be crushing on the kind of girl who'd happily walk off with her arm around an obvious psychopath who just tried to run someone over. Justin really doesn't seem to care, though. He's so thirsty for Chi-Chi, he can't even get his key up when she's not around. Like, the film makes a big point of showing us that he can't use key blasts, but then, right after first grade astronomy, he sees a chance to impress her, and suddenly he can blow open a whole row of lockers like it's nothing. And just so you know it's not a coincidence, the same thing happens again when he's trying to learn the Kamehameha. Every time you light a torch, you get to take one step closer to me. What happens after I light all five torches? Very impressive. Forget Super Saiyan, this boy's super simpin'. Also, the locker thing is what passes for a meat cute in this movie. Use your key. Wait, you know about key? Ah yes, the popular pretty girl is a secret nerd about the same thing he's a nerd about. Could this pandering be any more obvious? On that note, could Justin be any more over-eager? Hey, I'm having a party tonight at my house. I'll be there. Fuck, dude, at least pretend you haven't followed her home before. Soon enough, we see him getting ready for the party, and with it comes one of the movie's only decent jokes. Beauty awaits. Sure, it's totally out of character, but anime hair do be like that anyway. Because Goku's gotta be Spider-Man, Justin needs to let his adopted dad down in some way right before he's murdered. So, even though Gohan seems like he'd be totally cool with it if he just asked, he sneaks out to the party while his grandpa's busy cooking him a special birthday dinner. Goku, happy birthday! Goku? <laughs> this is the best birthday I've ever had. A few of Gary's goons attack Justin as soon as he arrives at the party, but because he suddenly cares about keeping promises to his grandpa again, he can only evade their attacks and goad them into fighting each other. He does the same thing to the boss bully when he shows up, and I know you're all expecting me to meme on this bit now. But... One, that's been done to death in every other video about this movie, and two, this is actually kind of the best fight in the film, low as the bar for that is. You can follow the action reasonably well, a few cuts last long enough to appreciate some of the stunt work, and it's clearly intended to serve as a comic relief bit before Gohan dies. So I'd say for how many people have laughed at it, that hair slide gag more than succeeds at what it sets out to do. Besides that, I'm more concerned with what this scene does to the characters, because while Justin doesn't lay a finger on the bullies, uh, Chi-Chi doesn't know that. She just walks out to find him surrounded by a circle of her unconscious party guests, and given that context, it's kind of fucked up that she just follows him back inside to flirt without bothering to check on any of them. Movie Chi-Chi comes off as this flaky, amoral fight slut who will fall for any guy who can beat up the last guy she fell for. This is 
apparently motivated by the artificial off-screen conflict that she loves martial arts, but her parents just don't get it, which is literally exactly the opposite of what a Chi-Chi is. As he's busy macking on her, Justin's spider sense starts tingling, signifying that it's finally time for the plot to happen. Back home, Piccolo shows up looking for the four-star ball, which I guess has just been in this same house for the last 2,000 years, because if he had a way of detecting it, he would have just gone to the party, right? Anyway, it's not there, so he gets pissed and force chokes Gohan, a thing he can apparently do, before dropping the whole ass house on his head out of spite. Which is not a thing that would even daze your average key user, let alone kill him, but that's a nerd nitpick, and there's a much more fundamental problem with Gohan's death. The sole purpose of this film's first act is to give the audience enough time to get attached to these characters so we'll feel something when Gohan dies in his grandson's arms. It doesn't work because everything about this movie is terrible, but it does create the impression that this relationship is the emotional core of the story, which it absolutely is not. And that means you get some big old narrative blue balls when, at the end of the film, our hero uses the Dragon Balls to revive an old weirdo he's known for a week and not the man who raised him or even everyone who died because of Piccolo. The final scene of the movie, on the other hand, implies that Justin's relationship with Chi-Chi is supposed to be its real driving force and the heavy focus on her in this intro does support that idea, but if it was true, you'd think she'd be in the rest of it more? As uncharacteristically eager to brawl as this version of Chi-Chi is, the film only ever uses her as a sex prize for Justin to enjoy after he does a thing. She doesn't get involved in any major fights, and in her few minor ones, she very conspicuously leaves her sports bra unzipped, and her only contribution to the actual plot is getting knocked the fuck out because Goku knows so little about her that he immediately and hilariously fails the doppelganger test. Even though he can sense Ki, and, like, you'd think that as her stalker he'd have gotten a feel for hers by now, but that's beside the point. Her character is so completely disposable that the only time Jamie Chung interacts with any other member of the main cast besides Justin is when she's playing Mai in a Chi-Chi costume. What are you guys doing out here? Nothing. Nothing. Oh yeah, in case you missed it, the random ninja lady who follows Piccolo everywhere is supposed to be Emperor Pilaf's servant, Mai. And like, now that I say it, I'm sure you can see the resemblance. Mai's hair is basically a bob cut, only longer and not at all, and a trench coat is pretty much exactly the same thing as a skin-tight bodysuit with a boob window. It is downright uncanny how the production design team managed to capture the spirit of her character. Now, the whole Pilaf gang does end up serving Piccolo in the original manga for a spell, but the other two are MIA here because I guess a talking dog ninja and a megalomaniacal gremlin were just too unrealistic for a movie where a monkey man kung fu fights a green space alien for magic wish balls. So Piccolo just sort of shows up out of the blue riding around on a random airship that I think is supposed to be Pilaf's flying base, even though it looks more like Slave 1 by way of Final Fantasy. And aside from killing Gohan, pretty much all he does throughout the film is occasionally show up at a random place to do evil shit and, like, remind us he exists. Because Piccolo, the antagonist of the movie, doesn't directly interact with Goku, the protagonist of the movie, until the last 10 minutes of the movie. For the most part, he only talks to his titty ninja about Justin, and then one time he sends some rubber-suited Power Ranger goons to attack him at the one place that conveniently negates their healing factor. And that is maybe the worst thing about this whole film, because while every 90s kid loves both Dragon Ball and Power Rangers, any 90s kid can tell you that Dragon Ball is nothing like Power Rangers, Mom! You just... you just don't get it! <laughs> It's a real shame that Piccolo especially doesn't get to do more or play off the other actors, because James Marsters absolutely kills it in this role, owning every line of dogshit dialogue they gave him. Much easier to find without the water. It's clear that this Piccolo fucks. 
If you read interviews from the movie's release, it's also clear that Marsders cared deeply for the character and for Dragon Ball as a whole. He immersed himself in the lore of the film universe. Yeah, there's lore. Remember, they were planning to make at least three of these things in order to portray the villain as sympathetically and convincingly as possible. And he even purportedly asked the makeup team to make his head look grosser and wrinklier to better resemble old King Piccolo. Yet for all that effort and talent, all the movie can think to do with him is have him loom into frame like a dollar store Darth Vader and spout vaguely menacing one-liners. And it's not like they couldn't have made room to do more with him. Both Gohan and Chi-Chi are completely ancillary to the plot, remember, so every scene of terrible flirting and the whole first act could have been cut without changing anything else. And if they'd done that, hey, what do you know? The movie would have started with Goku meeting Bulma, just like the good versions of this story do. Okay, to be fair to screenwriter Ben Ramsey, who did personally apologize for writing this, so thanks for that, dude. Feature films are very different beasts from serialized comics or TV shows with totally different narrative constraints that any adaptation will need to adjust for. But to be even fairer, the biggest constraint is that movies are way shorter than those other things, and maybe, maybe, inserting 20 minutes of padding before an already stupid long story begins isn't the best way to solve that problem. I guess, in a roundabout way, that brings us to Bulma, who, honestly, I don't even know what the movie's trying to do with her. Her personality's all over the place in every scene, and by random chance it does line up with her manga counterpart a couple times when she's oscillating between uncomfortable flirting and petulant outbursts. Other times she's portrayed as a sorta no-nonsense, shoot-first, ask-questions-later rogue-type character who says every other line in an angry whisper, no matter how silly that sounds. Listen, idiot. If I was a piccolo, whatever that is, I wouldn't tell you. Though because subtlety is a foreign concept to this movie, she ends up coming off more as a unhinged, blue-fringed psychopath than the lovable rogue. I mean, yeah, Bulma also tried to shoot Goku dead when she first met him in the manga, but that was because he picked up and threw her car while she was in it, whereas her sole motivation for cold-blooded murder here is that he has a thing she wants in his pocket. Also, the whole thing where she calls the Dragon Ball a Prometheum Orb and wants to turn it into a power source is just really weird and kind of dumb. The contrast between her manga counterpart's genius intellect and puerile adolescent motivation of collecting the Dragon Balls to find a boyfriend was brilliant, and since basically all she does in the back half of this movie is make goo goo eyes at Yamcha, it would have fit this version of the character better also than trying to get famous by infinite energy. Other than that, she's really more of a plot device than a person. Her main purpose is to whip out the dragon radar when it's time for a scene transition. Though they, uh, they don't call it that. Well, you made a Dragon Ball Energy Locator? Dragon Ball Energy. DBE. Catchy name. I don't have monetizable words to properly convey how angry that line makes me, so let's just move on. Acting on Grandpa Gohan's last words, Bulma and Justin travel to find Master Roshi in Paozu City, which is named after the mountain Goku grew up on in the manga for some reason. Like, guys, if East City wasn't vaguely Asian-sounding enough for you, you could have just called it Azuma City, but whatever. There's a brief glimpse of a far better Dragon Ball movie in the scene where they're looking for Roshi. Justin actually acts kind of like Goku, pigging out on a big old turkey leg and being endearingly dumb about stuff. I have tried every possible spelling of Roshi in the directory. He's not listed. Can you try Master? The film also manages to sneak in one bit of genuinely interesting world building when its interpretation of Kame House is revealed. A lone, dilapidated brownstone perched atop an isolated rocky outcropping, surrounded by a vast construction pit carved out to make room for more of the crazy future city off in the distance. It's not much, but it feels like there's a story here, some hidden darkness in the city, a reason Roshi chose to live off the grid, and I want to learn more about that. Although all of it flies out the window as soon as we actually meet him. Chow Yun Fat playing Roshi should have been an easy slam dunk for this film. He's by far the best martial artist in the entire cast, an all around fantastic physical actor, and while it has no bearing on his performance, he's also just a great dude in general. Sadly, the camera work and editing conspire to absolutely butcher his impeccable stunt work, bringing him down to the level of the goddamn white belt Goku for most of the film, and speeding up the one halfway decent long shot 
shot of him until his skillful moves become an incomprehensible blur. <laughs> The other thing that strikes me about that shot is just how bad it sounds. Like, why does Goku grunt faster when he punches faster? That's not how breathing works, guys. You should know this. You do it literally all the time. That said, I can't chalk all of the problems with Roshi up to bad editing and filmmaking, because when he's called on to express emotions other than fighter stuff, Chow Yun Fat tends to overdo it a bit. I am Muten Roshi! Being principal! <laughs> My grandfather is dead. This isn't bad acting per se, he's just a very animated performer, but when everyone around him delivers their lines with all the energy and charisma of a department store mannequin, and he's literally the only member of the main cast who knows how to act with his hands, he ends up coming off as a bit of a bug-eyed lunatic by comparison. Finally. I can see. You, you are the key. Somehow, go handle it. That's why he trained you. Roshi's defining character trait in the original series was his perverse hedonism, a subversion of the pious mentor archetype, which even in the original anime was more eye-rolling than funny a lot of the time, but this movie's half-hearted way of dancing around it is somehow even more uncomfortable. Bikini quarterly? <laughs> That's a collector's edition. <laughs> Leave your hand there another second, and you'll lose it. Let's go. Ah! Oh, Look, either embrace his shameless side for the fans who enjoy it, or write it out of the film for those who don't. Flimsy compromises like this leave no one happy. Adding insult to injury, they don't replace all the missing personality with anything of substance. This Roshi's just a generic, wise old Asian guy with some quirky mannerisms, pretty much the exact kind of character the original was made to spoof. With Bulma having been downgraded to clueless sidekick, Roshi takes up the mantle of the team's resident Dragon Ball expert, which mainly involves telling us things we already know in a vaguely mystical sounding manner. Seven. Dragon Balls must be found, for all men's fate will be bound. That's a real first draft ancient prophecy if I've ever heard one, which I guess makes sense because it's also completely irrelevant to the story of the movie. The balls contribute exactly nothing to stopping Piccolo in the climax, and in fact, by gathering them, Justin and the gang only end up helping him with his evil plans. And there's so many loose ends left dangling across the various studio butchered revisions of this script that I genuinely cannot tell if the prophecy is supposed to be subverted in some way, or they just forgot about it. Either way, in the movie as is, it's mainly there as an excuse for Justin to have these cheesy apocalyptic visions whenever he picks up one of the balls, which are sadly the only even remotely interesting thing the movie does with any of them. In the original manga, the Dragon Balls were a pretty ingenious plot device that allowed Akira Toriyama to whisk his heroes off to whatever far-flung corner of the world he wanted to dream up next and tell basically any story he could imagine there. The early series is largely driven by the joy of discovering what crazy nonsense they'll have to deal with to get the next ball. And this movie could have been that, but building fun side stories and memorable set pieces around the balls would have taken time that it thinks is better spent on vapid high school bullshit, so instead most of them just sort of show up, like fall in a hole, find a dragon ball, evaporate a whole lake, or burn down a village off screen, dragon ball. Play a five minute lava level, which I'm just now realizing was supposed to be Fire Mountain. Yeesh. Dragon Ball. Literally just rummage through an old man's garbage. Dragon Ball. This is some of the most profoundly unsatisfying storytelling I've ever seen in anything, and for most of its second act, from the moment we meet Roshi to the appearance of Chi Chi's doppelganger, it's kinda all the movie is. It follows the manga's structure of using the dragon radar to drag our heroes wherever the plot is and having them go train whenever that's not happening, but then when they get to those places, there is no plot to be found, only terrible dialogue and a mounting sense of disappointment. To break up the monotony, in theory 
at least. The act is interspersed with cutaways to Piccolo saying, Hi, I'm Piccolo, I'll be important later, and a couple of sides where our heroes conveniently run into Chi-Chi so we can get more of this scintillating romantic chemistry. Come to the tournament in Toy Sun. Maybe we can find some time to mix it up. The closest thing to a story development that happens in this stretch of movie is the introduction of Yamcha. He doesn't actually do anything, like he drives the team around, but Bulma was already doing that. His car contributes more to the plot than he does, but he's there. There's uh, this one pretty funny gag where he goes in for a fist bump and Roshi thinks he's attacking him, and he delivers this one line pretty good. You're nothing but a low-life bandit. Yeah. But what would the latter? Real shame about the rest of his lines. Peace <laughs> and right. I just ride my man. <laughs> it doesn't help that most of his dialogue has very obviously been dubbed over in post, which makes his already awkward lines sound even more jarring. Yamcha's presented as this flippant, self-assured surfer bro douchebag who cares for nothing but money and has a way with the ladies, which is a slight deviation from the manga's gynophobic but otherwise brave and serious lone wolf martial artist whose ambition exceeds his ability. S seriously, were they trying to make every character the exact opposite of that character? Even Justin treats Yamcha like an afterthought when he finally relays his visions of doom to Roshi. He will kill you. And Bulma. And Yamcha. Is that a hint of excitement I hear? And Yamcha. It's always the quiet ones. After all the balls are accounted for, Roshi's like, oh shit, it's almost time for the climax, and we haven't established any of the things we need to use in it. So they go to Toysan to do that. Roshi asks his old master, Sifu Norris, to prepare a containment vessel for the Mafu Ba. Norris responds, oh no, that'll kill you. Are you sure? And Roshi's like, have you fucking seen our Goku? We are doomed. Besides, it's Dragon Ball. Death is meaningless. Chi-Chi's there too during the tournament thing she mentioned. She fights Mai in front of some confused extras for a couple seconds before getting her blood stolen. Then Justin shows up to say congrats and walk her up the arena steps where the camera can get a better view down her top. Are you in the tournament? No, I'm here for something else. Something more important than me. Actually, you're one of the reasons why it's so important. That line made it through five script revisions. Also, the extras sparring match that's happening behind them is somehow the most coherently shot fight in this entire movie, and that's just incredibly sad. As is the film's rushed attempt to establish a romance between Yamcha and Bulma. You know, I'm not so bad once you get to know me. Maybe I like bad men. We cut back from whatever that was to Roshi and Justin training, and oh boy was it a mistake to put Chatwin's flaccid fake Tai Chi in the same frame as the real deal. All of a sudden, Roshi's like, hey, the Kamehameha's a thing that you gotta learn? To which Justin responds, right, my grandpa told me about that. It has always been an important plot point that I was aware of, we just never brought it up. Roshi shows Justin how it's done, then he shows the audience what real romantic chemistry looks like. I will see you in the morning. Mm-hmm. On a completely unrelated note, Chi-Chi then pokes her head in to help Justin train. He gets it, then gets some, and then Mai finally shows up to give you a new nightmare and or fetish before whisking the Dragon Balls off to green screen land. Though not before firing off a laser blaster thing that nearly kills Goku in a single shot. Which is, like, the least Dragon Ball thing ever, but luckily the Kamehameha doubles as a defibrillator in this movie. An idea that Akira Toriyama apparently liked because he made it canon in Resurrection F. While Roshi's busy saving him in the living world, Justin meets his grandpa at the threshold of the other one, who sends a bit of a mixed message by pulling this spooky bullshit. It's not your time, Goku. There's much left to do. Then he takes advantage of this rare parting of the astral veil to, to tell Justin a thing he's already told him. Grandpa, how? How do I defeat Ozaru? Always have faith in who you are. This vague advice is the closest thing Dragon Ball Evolution has to a running theme, in that it is the sequence of words that comes up most often in its script. You must have faith in who you are. Oh, 
with Hepnes and who you are. None of the film's conflicts actually speak to that theme in any meaningful way. In fact, it's not even what stops Ozaru. That would be Roshi's death shocking Justin back to his senses. And between that, the tragic dick move he pulls on his grandpa and his hormone-powered key attacks, the movie's subtext much better supports the alternate theme of always think of your loved ones, but the Fox execs probably figured that wouldn't resonate too well with their imagined audience of friendless nerds, so instead we're left with a generic refrain of just be yourself. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Once Justin comes down from his post-resurrection orgasm, the gang, minus Chi-Chi, of course, hops in Yamcha's jeep to go stop Piccolo from summoning Shenron. In this film's lore, that has to be done at a special mystical location called the Dragon Temple, which rises up from a barren, rocky canyon when all seven Dragon Balls are gathered there. And while that's not exactly faithful to the source material, I do think it's a decent cinematic conceit. The temple's design is pretty cool and suggests a long history with all those eroded dragon statues running up its towering spires, even if the CGI used to render it all is a little early 2000s for a late 2000s movie. Speaking of bad CGI, it turns out Yamcha's car can fly. That's neat. Weird they didn't use it to get the Dragon Ball in the volcano, but whatever. The flying car lets them get close enough for Roshi to attack with the Kamehameha, though Piccolo is able to fire back and their beams clash. The resulting blast looks pretty cool by this movie's standards and knocks the Dragon Balls out of the temple, but it also sends the jeep careening into the ravine below, jettisoning Roshi in the process and sending an avalanche of rubble crashing down on his head, which he immediately brushes off like it's nothing, further emphasizing just how lame Gohan's death really was. Before exiting the vehicle, Justin finally takes a second to don this film's approximation of Goku's iconic orange gi, which he found in the wreckage of his grandpa's house at the start of the movie, then he steps out to fight in a moment of tepid fan service that comes a good 50 minutes after anyone who might appreciate it would have already left the theater. Still, Goku is finally here, kind of, in almost the Goku shirt and everything. And after an hour of waiting, we're finally gonna get to see our hero and villain trade blows. But first, they must trade words. You will bear witness to my glory when I compel Shen Long to grant me the power to rule this diseased rock. I will defeat Ozaru, and I'm here to destroy you. It, it, okay, can I take back what I said about wanting more character interaction? This limp turd is only dragging the glorious King Piccolo down. When the blood moon eclipses the sun, you will become Ozaru. What? No. The eclipse happens, and despite Justin's best and most hilarious efforts to hold it in, <laughs> nothing can stop the shitty CGI from oozing out of him. And the effects really only get worse from there. Originally, Ozaru's design was totally bafflingly different from the manga, like it made Human Teeth Sonic look downright sensible by comparison. And much like that other abomination, it had to be changed at the last minute after a very predictable backlash. It's obvious that the likely already overworked and underpaid effects team didn't have the budget or will to live left to actually composite the new design into more than a few seconds of live action footage. So when Justin gives chase to take the last Dragon Ball from Bulma and Yamcha, they can only sort of imply he's there by staring and screaming at something off camera. They didn't even have time to decide how big he's supposed to be. In some shots, he looks huge like his anime counterpart, but in others, he's barely taller than the other actors. And then for some shots of his legs, they just use a regular guy in boots. These contradicting images are cut together so rapidly that it's straight up dizzying. I don't think I've ever seen a less convincing creature effect in a Hollywood film. The scene built around it isn't much better. It kind of feels like the other characters are competing to see who can do the most action movie cliches the fastest before the movie ends. After they run into the caves, Yamcha stops and does this old thing. Go. which wastes a lot of time they both could have spent getting away. Bulma throws him a gun to defend himself, but then the American Saiyan in Toysan clever girls him through a solid rock wall before he can actually do anything with it. Outside, Roshi makes Piccolo vibrate uncontrollably with the...
His obligatory dramatic mentor sacrifice doesn't actually accomplish much beyond winding Piccolo for a few seconds, but that's conveniently just enough time for him to grab the rampaging Justin's attention and pass on one more nugget of wisdom before passing on himself. Oh, sir. Can be beaten with fists. Only with faith. It's not quite enough to stop Justin from choking the remaining life out of him, but after that, he gets real torn up about doing it and has a revelatory montage. And I shit you not, to show him changing back, they literally just play the animation of him transforming backwards. And that's not the only poorly made thing they lazily reuse here. Impossible. Something my grandfather taught me. First rule is... There are no rules. Okay, reincorporating lines to make your script seem cleverer than it is is a pretty stale and lazy writing trick to begin with, but that doesn't even make sense as a response to the thing he said? Try a little harder, please. Anyway, they throw key blasts back and forth at each other for a bit, which for some reason sound like Star Wars blasters sometimes. <laughs> With the two of them flipping all over the place and the editors moving at an average of like two cuts per second, this fight is already pretty much impossible to follow on its own, and the film makes things even more confusing by cutting back and forth between it and Bulma battling Mai in the caves, so she has something to do. When we cut back, Justin and Piccolo can suddenly fly, I guess, and after trading a few blows, they knock each other through some rocks in what's probably the most Dragon Ball part of the movie. It lasts a total of 15 seconds. We cut back to Bulma as she tries to bamboozle Mai by tossing her capsule bike at her. It doesn't work, but luckily Yamcha did that thing earlier, so now he can show up and dramatically save her at the last second. Back in the fight that actually matters, relatively speaking, Goku finally understands what his grandpa was trying to tell him all along, I think. I am Goku. I am Ozaru. Be a one with myself, I must be two. Hey, can I get some of whatever he's smoking? Justin charges up his key for one final attack and Piccolo responds in turn. Finally, he's doing the thing. Kame! This film has one last chance to make the anime real. Kame! We're gonna have a big screen beam clash. <laughs> Tommy, damn it, what the fuck was that? Why did he fire a beam if he was just gonna jump up at him and punch him anyway? Why can't this movie get anything right? The beam clash is like the simplest Dragon Ball thing to do right. It's free tension and payoff in a bottle and a perfect formulaic denouement to cap off any fight. All you gotta do is put two guys on opposite sides of a screen and do some CGI between them. It would have been easier to do it right than to do whatever that was. It's like the movie is actively trying to do as many things to disappoint fans as it possibly can. Though, on the bright side, they do finally get Justin's hair looking almost right after he dusts himself off for the last scene. Good job, hair and makeup team. In that last scene, they finally summon the dragon, and the way they do it looks and sounds really dumb, and it doesn't even look anything like Shenron when it shows up. Kind of just seems like they grabbed a random dragon off the Unity Asset Store, but the movie's almost over, and frankly, I'm tired. Once Roshi's alive again, Bulma threatens us with a sequel, and Justin runs off to go make out with Chi-Chi so the movie can pretend she was important. And then, for some reason, they get arguing about who'd win in a fight, and the final shot is them leaping at each other, like Andrew Garfield pouncing on the rhino. And I guess it's supposed to be ambiguous who'd win that fight, even though Chi-Chi fought to a draw against Mai, whose punches didn't even phase Justin, but... Whatever, that doesn't matter. The credits roll, and after the fancy CGI part, there is one more scene left, because this came out after Iron Man, so of course there is. But it's literally just a lady walking over to a bed, and then the camera leans in like, who's in it? Who could it be? Oh man, it's the bad guy! Dramatic music! This is an 
utterly meaningless shot that provides no new information and only serves to roll back the lone bit of closure the film's ending actually gave us. I don't think you could write a more perfect parody of this cynical, sequel-baiting trope if you tried. Yet it's not a parody. That scene and this entire movie is 100% serious about trying to milk the Dragon Ball name for all it's worth. It's just hilariously bad at it. Dragon Ball Evolution is what every good filmmaker working for a studio must fight against to make good films. It is focus testing, market research, demographic pandering, trend analysis, a franchise roadmap, and everything else that capitalism contributes to cinema, extracted and isolated from the meaning, artistry, passion, and basic storytelling ability that creators forced to work within that system bring to the table. It is a product, soulless and empty, produced solely to empty your wallet. And the system that produced it, the only system that could ever produce something like it, is the dominant governing force in all of our lives. There. Now that silly little virus thing doesn't sound all that bad, does it? Wait, fuck. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.